I have read the myth of the journey ocean, the journey of the ocean requiring both the devas and the asuras means that one has to come to terms with both demonic and divine qualities in order to fight moksha. Is this correct? How could we distinguish demonic and divine qualities when everything is Brahman? This ocean churning story is a wonderful allegory for the Lord. Very nice. Rife with symbolism and metaphors. Samudra Manthana. And what is this Manthana? This Manthana churning means that there is some kind of an agitation. This is what the churning is. And so first we see the story itself and then we see the metaphors. A few, we, can't, we don't have time to go into all of them. So the first uh, thing obviously is, uh, is the ocean. There is an ocean and the devas and the asuras are told. <laughs> the devas and the asuras are told what? Gems, 13 kinds of gems are there, and they will all come out, and you have to churn this ocean. You say, How to churn the ocean? We don't know how to churn the ocean. Churn the ocean. Churn the ocean. And Asura said, Well, the matter, we'll try to do something. And for the first time, the Devas and Asuras kind of come together for a common purpose. And then what happens? The ocean churning rod, churning stick is needed. The mountain is the churning stick. That also sinks. But then, Purma Avatara comes. Hare Purma, Hare Purma comes and uh, stabilizes the churning stick, holds the churning stick on its uh, shell and so that they can churn. But the churning stick is not enough. We need a churning the rope. Rope. That's how they do it even now in rural areas in India. They say, oh, they go like this. Uh, it is wrapped once, one and a half times around, and it goes very nicely like this. So then, one poor python, minding his own business, because oh, okay. <laughs> that was the only thing that was long enough. But poor python, very toxic, extremely toxic. And then, you know, the devas trick the asuras. Because each time Vasuki breathed out, four or five people would just fall down because it was so toxic that they, they would just faint. So the devas tricked the rakshasas and said, Who wants to be at the mouth of the snake? Who is brave enough to be the mouth of the snake? And the stupid, egotistic devas, maybe, maybe they said that they took the mouth of the snake. And uh, the asuras did. And the devas took the tail. That also was not easy because the poor thing was wrapped one and a half times around this mountain. And it was in pain and it was slapping with the tail mouse. And the mouth, of course, was terrible because full of toxic breath. It was 
four five asuras khadar khadar they would fall down and somebody had to do a wet hanky and revive them they had to revive them and then all these things came out before the things came out what came out was this hala 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 kya vishap poison called hala hala Usually, when Vasuki breathed, everybody else would faint. But when Hala Hala came out, poor Vasuki fainted, and he had to be revived. It was so toxic, so toxic, so toxic. Nobody would handle it, the fumes of it, and it was clear that it was a great danger. Nobody could handle it. Then Lord Shiva manifested and said, "I will." Neutralize it, and the story we know. He tried to drink it, and Parvati put a hand on his throat. Parvati is not not everybody else. Who is Parvati? Shakti. He is all Shakti. She put a hand on the throat, symbolizing that using his own Shakti, he managed to not come under the spell of the Hala. That's why he is blue throat. Nilakanta, which is right over there, <laughs> few kilometers away from where we sit, Nilakant Mahadev, and so this is how he got the epithet, the blue-throated one, <laughs> because he was able to neutralize this uh, poison, very terrible poison. Then after that, all the goodies started to come out. Uh, some some nice things came. Lakshmi uh, Lakshmi gave some different forms of Lakshmi came. So many things came. Uh, Dhanvantri came. Dhanvantri, the Lord Vishnu in the form of the healer, along with Ashwin twin number one, Ashwin twin number two. You don't know whose idea it was to call both of them Ashwin. Already I didn't think it. <laughs> Both of them, Ashwini one, Ashwini two, Ashwini one, Ashwini two. Very difficult to distinguish. But nonetheless, that's who they were, and they came and everything. And so the story is goes like this. Now the uh, ocean churning is the, 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 the ocean is the unconscious mind. God only knows what all is in there. The Uh, the ancient, what's its name? Ancient means very old. Early childhood impressions, fears, tears, anxieties, samskaras, vasanas, they are all part of this mind. Unconscious mind. The unconscious mind, in order to be churned, needs a lot of, needs a lot of help. And the devas and the asuras had to come together, meaning the raga devas and all the asura asuric type of beings, and the adult also has to has to cooperate to take a look into the mind. So the journey of this ocean is a metaphor for taking a look into the mind. And the unconscious mind, the uh, since it's an ocean, we can also say the collective unconscious of all the jivas came out in the form of Madhavala. One's own pain, one can barely stand. Imagine if it is uh, the pain of the entire universe of all kinds of beings, human beings here, human-like beings elsewhere. Everybody's thing is just here. And so, therefore, this was uh, this was threatening to be a fiasco. And Lord Shiva's grace, because people prayed, they didn't know what to do. Even Vasudev would handle it. The story goes, Lord Shiva's grace came to the aid because this is the grace which is the phala, drishta uh, phala of prayer, which just we were hearing. Uh, Abhijit Swamiji said that this was the Krishna Mahal 
of prayer and so therefore this prayer came Kairutyam fructified immediately and the surrender to Lord Shiva made the pain of the unconscious uh, neutralized neutralize the pain of the unconscious and that is what it is called Pradosha special evening this is the Pradosha Puja every 13th day of the um, cycle either the full moon cycle or the new moon cycle Shukla Paksha, Krishna Paksha we uh, do this we do this special worship at evening time to Lord Shiva to thank him for neutralizing the unconscious mind. When the unconscious mind does not keep coming out in the form of fears, resistance, block, pain, sorrow, then Vedanta is easily assimilated. That was the goodies, so many goodies that were shared. Airavata, elephant, so many things. Certain things came out, I don't, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what they are. And so all of them are Upalakshana for making progress, healing, Nanvantari, Nanvantari came out, so the healing is there, everything happens. When the unconscious mind is taken care of, then all other things fall in place. Whether you need, whether you want, Mukti, prosperity and pleasures of the worldly realm or Mukti. Mukti means what? Moksha. Freedom from wanting altogether. All that is a show. But the unconscious mind has to be neutralized by surrendering to Bhagavan. Surrendering it to Bhagavan means seeing that I am not being targeted. Every mind is under that spell. Knowing that, one allows it to go. So that is the allegory of the churning of the could you please explain a little more about Karana Sharira, its location and functions? Location or to you know, it is uh, it doesn't have a location. What is it? It is Agnana. Agnana is Karana Sharira. Okay? Agnana. Not much we can say about the Karana Sharira. It is Atma Adhyana. Karana Sharira means what is the cause of birth. What is the cause of birth? We all know. Atma Adhyana. So that becomes a causal body. But when we say it in English, causal body is very mystified. It doesn't explain anything. So the best way to look at it is cause of birth. Adhyana. That is the causal point. Nothing more to say. Because it is not, it is Mithya. Like everything it is Mithya. So for a law, ultimately this even self-ignorance is not opposed to Atma. I mean Atma is not opposed to self-ignorance. Because that's how I can say I am ignorant and I want to take care of it. When I say I am ignorant, I am basically saying I know that I do not know. So it is it accommodates the ignorance. So that means it's all knowledge. That's what I am. And here a little bit of ignorance with regard to the self is dismissed through the Shastra, Guru, etc. And so if we keep looking for the location of the what is that called? Causal body, karma, shadira, then there will be no end to it. We are trying to look for the uh, where is the harvested rabbit's horn located? Please tell me. I just harvested two rabbit's horns very special and I kept it in a safe place. Please tell me where it is. First of all, that rabbit's horn itself is what? Non existent. And the car and the sharita which goes away in the wake of knowledge, non existent. It enjoys at best a temporary existence. So it really doesn't have a location. It is, we can say, its location is in the is in the ahankara, the high notion of the one who is asking the question. Prashtu Swarupe Eva, that is where Agnana is located, we can say. 
Because the one who says I am ignorant, that's the one who is possessing the uh, ignorance. So the Sharira is not located anywhere, it's not a body, it is just called a body. It's, it's uh, self-ignorance, that's what it is. Okay. Then, You said something don't have karma. Uh, karma sankarpa. Yeah. Karma sankarpa. But if there is no karma, there is no movement. What will generate initiative? You know, I wanted to discuss this very thing today, but we ran out of time. So I have deferred it until after the week. This is a very important question. What is the question? The question is No Kama, no Sankarpa. Yes, yes, Arvesa Varanta, Kama Sankarpa, Vrishita, Nyaba, Vidak Nakatmana, Kama Huf Pandit, and Buddha. It's nice to be called a Pandit, it's wonderful. So then, the 8 million people, Pandit number 1, Pandit number 2, Pandit number 3, Pandit number 8 billion. 8 billion to Pandit. And what are all these Pandits doing? No karma, no desire, no sankatva, no initiative, no planning. Then what will happen to the world? Everybody gets moksha. Then what will happen to the world? It will grind into a halt. There will not be any discoveries. There will not be any anybody going to space. There will not be anything. Well, if Ajnana is the propagator of karma and karma, it has some uses after all. The, this is the argument behind this. It has some uses, it has brought the world so far. Really, what the technological progress? Did they say, what about technological progress? What about discoveries? What about inventions? I think really, our ancestors had a better life than we are. In, in, in numerous ways. But then in some other ways our lives are better. Both ways we can argue. So the, in short, so that since the weekend is coming, I don't want to leave you hanging for two days to get this answer. So I'll just mention it in brief and we'll take it up in detail when we resume the class on Thursday. And so what is the, in brief, we say that it, uh, the uh, Gama and Sankalpa uh, does not mean no actions. Actions are there. Samarambha means actions. But the actions are not bound by agenda for a particular kind of outcome. That means what? Actions are freed from my own agenda, my own, my own uh, what is that? You know, stubbornness. This is how it has to be. This should lead this result. And I become a control king, trying to control everything. That is missing. That is not there. So, what is there is just the, the jnani initiating action is absolutely free. And that means what? There, there, is, there is the driving force for action and give a small hint and we we'll let it rest because I have to take it in much more detail. In the, the driving force for action in the absence of karma and sankarpa will be compassion. And compassion is a much better karuna. Daya. Daya and karuna are much better propellers of action than Kama and Sankara. So we we'll let it rest there because uh, we will be taking it up in detail on Thursday. People are saying different opinions and experiences about Atma Jnana. As a serious seeker, what are the important steps we should be following? Is Atma Jnana possible in this life? Yes. When? Not when. 
where or how exactly we won attain Atma Jnana. Atma Jnana is one of those things that is already attained. That is called Moksha. So that is already there. One is free. But one does not know it. And so therefore that knowledge is called Atma Jnana. As long as there is an eclipse of ignorance over the over the eyes, over the heart, whatever, then as a result what happens? One does not know the truth of oneself and that leaves the person free to make all kinds of mistakes centered on the I. I am not good enough. I am not knowledgeable enough. I am not free enough. I am not lovable enough. Whatever the confusions are, I am not confident enough. These are all the wrong confusions, but they stick because they have the bala of samskara. Previous samskara, samskaras are, are there to make them look real. Number one. And number two, they appear real because they become part of the lived everyday reality. So, whatever is experienced seems much more real than Atma Jnanam, which is knowledge. So, everybody wants to, there is, there, is a, uh, there is a general tendency to want to experience Brahma Jnanam, Atma Jnanam. If Brahma Jnanam was an object of experience, then it would become finite, like Samosa. <laughs> Samosa, wonderful, uh, until it lasted. And then what? Gone, finite. Oh, but the happiness stayed. Yes, it stayed for maybe an hour. Samosa was over in five minutes. Uh, Atma Jnana stayed for an hour, 55 minutes. But then after that, what? Back to same old, same old. So therefore, if it was one more experience, no matter how thrilling, no matter how special, no matter how extended, if Atma Jnana is an experience that is away from me, it will be finite. An experience by definition is that which comes and then goes. So Atma Jnana is to be gained uh, that in a, in a cognitive way. Because it is not an experience, it cannot be an experience. Why? Because it is the truth of the experiencer, myself alone. Atma Jnanam, what is Brahma Jnanam or Atma Jnanam? It, it basically says, you are not divided. We, 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 we seek experiences, but those experiences are always based on division. Me plus Samosa. Samosa object of experience. I experience it. And then of course the tongue and the nostrils become what? Means of experience. This is how I experience as a human being. I experience each and everything discreetly one by one by one. Starting with Indra and all the celestials, everybody experience this duality with the dead. Because if I want a thrilling, happy, exciting, wonderful experience, then there should be a fusion of the subject with the object. And that which causes the fusion, the oneness of the subject with the object is what? A means of knowledge. Whether it is the five pratyaksha pramanami or whether it is the uh, inference, anumana, etc. So that is that means of knowledge bridges the seer and the seeing, the lower and the lower, etc. That is why it is a truncated, dissatisfying experience. No matter how wonderful, how exciting, the experience always leaves one longing. Because it is cut up into experience. So, when, so when I am the experiencer, I cannot be the object of experience. 
I'm the object of experience. If I identify with the object of experience, I am not the experiencer. Then if I identify with the sights and sounds, then I am not either of these. But Brahma Jnana is that well through which I understand, through which instruction I understand that the truth of this beauty, this tripod is actually one. There is just one thing. And that is the one which upholds or morphs or manifests as the experiencer also is not separate from the object of experience and, and the one that connects the two, the means of knowledge. See here, see, sight, all three are Brahman. So what is Brahman? Neither see here nor see nor sight. All three are Brahman, Brahman is not any one. That Brahman is I. This is what I have to understand. And so when I understand this, then the, the frantic need to become one with objects, situations, people and events just goes down. Why? Because I discover in myself an objective, contented, non-demanding, appreciative, non-judgmental person. That is Atmanya. And it is not something that happens in a, uh, what is that called, a stroke. It is more of a shedding. Shedding of notions. Shed, 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 shed. Okay, I, I feel that like I know now. And then, that's what? Two months into the test. Yes, I know. I'm understanding this. Two more months. Then what happens? Shed, 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 shed. That's why it's called. What we study is called Upanishad. Okay. <laughs> shed. Shed, 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 shed. More shedding. Oh my God! I, I thought I knew two months ago, but now it is so much more clear. Some more shed, 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 shed. Not I, not I, not I, not me, not me, not me. And the me shines more and more clearly, less and less inhibited. That is what self knowledge is. Self knowledge cannot be an event in time because then time becomes the canvas on which self knowledge, you know, is, is the mark. Okay. And then some sadhus, uh, I don't know, they even celebrate what is that word? Enlightenment day. You know, that, but that's okay. That's fine. But you know, they can celebrate that. Maybe they feel like they have got enlightenment or they understood that they. Uh, they are no longer ignorant, fine, and they want to mark a day for that. But it can be misleading because when they see this enlightenment, uh, what is it called? Enlightenment day being celebrated, then we have the feeling. Naturally, people don't know. People think that yes, this is this happens in time, at a particular time. It cannot. The self is the canvas of time. Time is not the canvas on which the self is unfolding because the self is timeless. Time and space has, as it were, as though emerged from the self, not the other way around. So that is what is Atma Jnanam. And yes, you can get it in a lifetime, otherwise the six month course would not even have been commenced. Why is it so difficult for the ahankara to stop identifying with the body-mind sense complex? Where does the ahankara's fear come from? Ahankara is very stubborn. Yeah. <coughs> it, it just it, it just wants what it wants. Yeah, it just says this is what I know because it is. Where does the fear come from? Only Bhagavan knows <laughs> where the fear comes from. The fear of being decimated. It thinks, oh, I have to resolve in Brahman, that means what? I won't be here. But that's not right, I want to be here. I have to be here because that's what I'm used to. I'm running the show, I'm in control. And you want to decimate me? You want to destroy me? I will destroy you first. That's what it says. Because it, it is used to, it is like it's like the thing of a small rural township in India 
called Raipur in the heart of Madhya Pradesh was woken up one day. This is a fiction, okay, just a story. Woken up one day and said, you know what? Henceforward, you are the king of the whole of India. What? He's still rubbing his eyes. He just woke up. What? Yes. So for one minute, not even one minute, half a minute, he was very happy. Then a new wave of fear and anxiety took a hold of him. He said, what about Raipur? Will I still be the king of Raipur? <laughs> this is exactly the Ahankar. It's being offered the whole universe, the cause of the universe on a platter. And he said, what about this body? Will I still be the, will I still be the master of this body? What about my little mind? What about my senses? Will I still have it? Yes, you will still have it. That is the fear of the Ahankara. That's why we don't say Ahankara Nashara, even though in the Vedanta uh, texts it's a frequent expression, Mano Nashara, Ahankara Nashara. We don't say Nasha, destruction. We say we lighten the burden of the Ahankara to understand that it is not just carrying on its shoulders the body, mind, sense complex. We free it to identify with the whole world. And there are two ways of doing it. One is you inflate, inflate, inflate the hankara. This is me, this is me, this is me, everything is me, everything is me. And so the balloon becomes very, very big beyond its capacity. What happens? Yes, it bursts. And then it's one with everything. Or you say nothing is me, nothing is me, nothing is me, nothing is me, until you become a pixel. And you are not even, you are not even in the reckoning. Then also it's one and the same. So there's two ways of uh, doing this, but Ahankara really doesn't exist. That which, like the politician uh, in most countries, which are on the Sahate, cannot stand inquiry. <laughs> that is Ahankara. As soon as you inquire, it, it disappears. Is integration of all four yoga paths better or Vedanta? Alone can help. The third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita says that there are not four paths. How many paths it says? Not even paths. Two lifestyles. Really, there is only one path if you want to talk path. Okay. Why? What is the problem? The problem is I don't know I am Brahman. Okay. And so what is the antidote? I have to know I am Simple it is. And so the other parts, what are they? Raja Yoga, Hatha Yoga, and then Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, and Ognana Yoga, all these are committed lifestyles. In order to know, that's all. So Jnana Yoga means dropping everything and take him to a life of just study. That is one lifestyle. Or you can add two lifestyles have been given, which are perhaps mistaken for parts, I don't know. And the other lifestyle is to continue to pursue all your desires dharmically, and then what do you do? You grow spiritually enough to be able to understand the message of Vedanta that you are limitless, you are whole, you are free of all kinds of encumbrances, finitude, smallness, etc. This is this is what is the teaching. So in order to do this, then the bhakti is common to both the karma yogi and the person who jnana yogi because the Subject matter of Vedanta is Ishvara. Because the alienation that I feel, the disconnection, the lack, is a separation as it were from the whole, from Ishvara, from the source. That separation is, is taken care of by this knowledge by showing that indeed there is no separation. 
First, the Jagat and Ishvara are, are made into one, and then the Jiva is left out, so to speak, at least cognitively, and then the Jiva is also included as Ishvara. Now, we separate from Ishvara. And so, for that, we have the Mahavakya called Tatvam Asi, and we analyze what is this one. It is not that which is identified with the body mind sense complex. Then when you analyze one, you get Sakshi. And what is this Sakshi? Awareness, observer, consciousness. What is the observer? Nothing but awareness. That awareness we have again, consciousness. And on the other side also we shake out the all the Anitya things associated with Ishvara like Shakti, uh, like the cause, being the cause of the universe, etc. And when you when you make this concept of Ishvara also as it were thread there, what do you get? Awareness, consciousness, satchidananda. So the two are same. This is what we have to understand. For this, as we saw in the third chapter, two lifestyles are recommended. One is to drop everything and go with the vision, the other one is to get the requisite majority to, to pursue this knowledge. So, and then the last part of the question said something about Vedanta. Four parts and Vedanta. Vedanta is not outside. Yeah. Vedanta is not outside of, of the uh, of the Karma Yoga and the Jnana Yoga. Both Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga is for Vedanta alone. Okay? And you have to understand the problem. The problem is ignorance. The antidote is knowledge. That's all. Because this cannot be accomplished by karma. Because karma is finite, results are finite, karana, the instruments of doing are finite, everything being finite. Then what is the problem? The problem is that I want the infinite. There is a contradiction. Vishnu Sahasranama, what is the significance of all the of the way all the names are ordered? Is there any grouping or placements of the invocations that should be considered together? Yes and no. Sometimes it is just Shiva poetry. Sometimes it rhymes. Sometimes it, it is alliterated. Everything will start with a certain letter. And it's very beautiful. It's sheer poetry. Sometimes then the grouping may be in, in like what did Vishnu as Avatara, Avatara do? <laughs> certain groupings. What is the then the second kind of groupings may be together? Like what is the essential nature of Vishnu, Satchidananda, Swarupa Lakshana? And then what is Vishnu as Bhagavan? That is Thalakshana. What are the duties, what are the functions, etc. All this sometimes they are grouped and then sometimes it is sometimes they, not in Vishnu Sasana, but certain Sasanamas uh, could be alphabetical, could be you know, the, you know, sometimes okay, there is one uh, the Shiva with the uh, 108 names, not Sasana, Ashtottara, Ashtottara Namavali. And then you will say, Om Omkara Sinha Sarvetra Vinaha, Om Omkara Dhyana Gopiya Vinaha, Om Omkara Nira Shukara Jainamaha, Om Omkara Aranya Kunjara Vinaha, like this it goes. So for the first four are Om Om, and then, uh, then it starts with Nagaraja Sutta Jamnagirena Maha, like this, Na, and then Ma, Na, Mo, Da, Bha, Da, Ma, Te. You can read that whole Dakshinamukti Mula Mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Dakshinamuktaye Mahyam Shriyam Vedham Pratnam Prayacha Swaha. You can just from the beginning of the uh, the words of the Nama, how beautifully it is arranged. There is the secret mantra that comes out. Very nice. So like that, it's all just the, uh, the beauty of the composition.
in as astrology Varna is mentioned, and that's a different thing. No? Varna is mentioned, it's different. It's, uh, there's also some yoni also mentioned, meaning uh, is animal yoni, yakshasa yoni, deva yoni like this. It is not to be taken seriously. It's just uh, based on certain astrological calculation. Pashu yoni doesn't mean the person is animalistic. Okay? It's some calculation, something like that. So don't take it too seriously. As the Varna mentioned, influence not necessarily, but certain tendencies may be there, and those tendencies we are not interested in the Varna, we are interested in the tendencies. So, if the astrologer says that there are certain tendencies, no, that, that won't be the sole factor, uh, it will be in connection with certain planetary conjunctions, alignments, aspects, etc. If there are certain tendencies, let's say towards distraction or towards anger or towards fear, those kind of, they can do some, offer some prayers and get some very hard, get some relief. Second last one, what is the best way to become disciplined without falling into inflexible and dogmatic attitudes? The answer is in the question, yes. Yeah, answer is in the question. So, disciplined, uh, you, you, one becomes disciplined, but a flexible discipline. Disciplined uh, is important, discipline is very important. But then, you don't uh, get rooted in that freely to the extent that somebody is, somebody is needing help. <coughs> When somebody is crying out for help, and you say, I have still 15 minutes more of my meditation afterwards, <laughs> they will come. So, you know, instantly, a human being that responds to situation. The heart is kept soft. That's, that's the idea. So, therefore, the dogmatism isn't coming in Vedanta, it won't come, especially if Vedanta is uh, internalized. In the way that it is supposed to be, uh, one will not be influenced because one will become more and more accommodated. So, this one, I'm forestalling a question by answering it. Uh, how do I go on making progress in Vedanta? I, I become more and more flexible, less and less dogmatic, more and more accommodative, more and more patient. That is, that is the, those are the signs. In regular household life, as opposed to irregular household life, okay, we have to trim plants, oh yeah, for aesthetic aspects, kill mosquitoes, some of the small small insects also. To what extent is this acceptable? There are tricky people in day to day life. Should we also be tricky? Or should we leave it to Karmapala? Theirs or yours, we have to see. But uh, yeah, we talked about this once uh, long back in the third chapter, and uh, this is called Panchasunaha. Panchasunaha Grihasthasya Chulli Prejani Upaskaraha. Then Kantani Udhakum Bhascha. Uh, something like that, it says. These are the five, every householder has five slaughterhouses. Oh my god, I have a slaughterhouse? Yes, not just one, five. So, what are they? Chulli, Sulha, means stove. Where all the moths and all of it are, and even if you use firewood as they did in the ancient times, small, small insects live on the firewood. And then they would, they would all just be swaha in order for you to eat the food and say, aha, they have all become swaha. So that was one thing. And then the second thing is what? Chulli, Peshani, Peshani, grinding stone. Chantikri, chutney, along with everything else. Okay, then third one, Upaskaraha. Upaskaraha means this jhadu. What is that? Room. 
gloom, gloom and mock. Terrible things, poor things, they all go scurrying and so many things you can't even see. And then there's a slaughterhouse and then uh, yeah, and then it means this is where you make all these masalas, mortar and pestle, and then they are also hapless insect can fall and commit suicide poor thing without intending to. And then the final one is water pot. Keep a pot of water and then by mistake for two minutes you forget to cover it and one lizard goes and falls. In, in one of the ashram tanks, a small baby monkey was found. Unfortunately not alive. Curious, they are all very curious. It must have all and fallen. And so, the, so these are all slaughterhouses. So therefore, in order to ward off the difficulties and the papa, of course one accrues power. Drinking plants is not papa because we are not uprooting them. We are just cutting up and things and leaves will grow back. There also you can say a prayer. And there also there is the achar. You don't do it in the evening. You don't do it after the, the sun has set. And, uh, and then you don't do it on certain cycles of the moon. We have to look into that. So then, uh, there, there is, that's why the daily prayers, Nitya Karma, wars of these small, small powers. Alright? That is, that is why we have to be doing Nitya Karma, always offering this, that, because we are, we, even when we breathe, we are killing. Because obviously we cannot coexist in certain life forms. We can't say the snakes have a right to live and therefore they can have my own. We cannot say that. So certain things remain outside, certain things can come in, you know, like certain things cannot come inside. This is there. And so we have to do what we need to do, but we have to do it prayerfully. And we have to say some prayers, Christ, Chitta Karma, to add Nitya Karma, words of some of these things. Om Happy weekend to all of you.